Hello, hello. We're going to get going here. Very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Eva Zabe. I'm the Executive Director of Business for Nature. And this session is all about the national implementation of the Global Biodiversity Framework and how important it is to have business government dialogues to be successful. So the two objectives, one is to discuss that with companies, with the Jeff, with CI. Number two is to speak louder than these people and have a number of jealousy laughs to make them feel that we're having a better time. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> okay, welcome, great. Uh, so as I said, we're really excited to welcome you all Business for Nature has actually uh, been partnering with the Jeff and CI as the implementation agency. We're kicking off a new phase of work which really gets into more of the details. So we've been looking quite high level, how do we influence the global biodiversity framework? And now the rubber really hits the road when it gets into national regulation, of course as companies revise their NBSAPs. And so leading businesses have a key role to play in engaging with those companies and other stakeholders up front. So that's the framing. And it's great to see a number of you are still here. So good. Um, I'm really delighted to uh, introduce two fantastic uh, people here with me. We've got Matthew Reddy, who's the senior private uh, sector specialist at the Global Environment F Facility and also Herbert Last, who's uh, the Senior VP of Global Public Partnerships at CI, Conservation International. So first to you, Matt, do you have any reflections, please, to share with everyone today? Thank you. Well, I think... I yeah, think you have to really put it on your chin, I think. <laughs> okay, well, I'll talk, talk in, in this uh, fashion here. So I think for us working in the Jeff, it's so important that we translate what is in the global biodiversity framework to the, to the national priorities. We're not going to get the traction and the results that we need. As you know, that we've just had the Jeff 8 replenishment, um, a hugely successful replenishment. And, it, and if you know about Jeff, we will operate in, in this idea of focal areas. So climate change, land degradation, neutrality, biodiversity, chemicals, conventions. And what we have now is what's known as integrated approaches, where the goals of all of those um, conventions uh, form um, integrated programs. But by far and away, the largest uh, section of our investment into the JEP 8 period um, is through biodiversity. And we started thinking about how we can really build the private sector into the approaches um, for biodiversity. It's always been a challenge. And the, the Jeff's strategy, the Jeff's approach to working with the private sector isn't to work bilaterally with companies or just work with a few of the innovative companies on, in some specific areas, but to really think about how we can transform systems, how we can work across entire industry sectors, entire landscapes, and really start to shift the way the private sector works and, and change the rules of the game so that those companies that are more sustainable supportive of biodiversity and net zero goals are in fact those that are most successful. And so BFN is probably one of the largest multi-stakeholder platforms that exists. I, I don't know of it. I mean, you look at the banner across the way, you, you, scores of organisations, many of our implementing agencies, in, including our partners at CI, are partners with BFN. So we said we have to work 
with BFN on bringing this mass. I mean, full credit to you, Eva, and your team on bringing such a mass, unprecedented mass of companies around this unified goal. Uh, I mean, not just one goal. I think there was four strategies that BFN has adopted, um, including the Make It Mandatory that you know, everyone is saying at every panel, so I've said it now too, make it mandatory. Well uh, but, but also this idea that, you know, we need to build this coalition of business that wants to go forward, wants to have um, manda not just mandatory disclosures, but to build these strategies into their own business operations, the way they work with their suppliers, the way they work with their customers, stakeholders and investors. And so for us, Working in this BFN program, working with CI is a way that we can bring that scale to support the countries and we're very much looking forward to the outcomes in the pilot countries. Thanks so much. I'm actually just going to ask you a quick follow-up before I go to you, Herbert. Is why is it important for leading businesses to be part of the engagement at a national level, would you say? I, I think there's a couple of areas there. I think the leading businesses are able to demonstrate that, that this can be done and they're, they're I guess, uh, examples that others can follow. And so if, if work is being undertaken in one country, it's easy then to see how that might be adopted into other countries. Leading businesses touch a lot of other leading businesses. You know, one big company will have suppliers, logistics, their banking sector. So you touch one or two of those big companies and you touch hundreds of companies. And so I think it's important to work with those leadership groups. Also the leadership groups are able to communicate in global fora like this about what they're doing. Fantastic. Well, we, we will be hearing from a few in a bit. Um, Herbert, what about you? CI's priorities and your engagement, what are your reflections? My first reflection is never come second in a panel because sort of half of, you know, what, what I was going to say is already said. Well, but we can say but to be time, honest, okay. but, <laughs> No, no, no worries. But, but sort of... You know, the, the, the reason why we're involved in this as CI is that sort of, uh, you know, for the last sort of 35 years, we've been exactly working in the space. So, you know, for 35 years, what we've been doing is protecting, preserving, restoring sort of nature. And obviously, that cannot just be done through sort of public funding. That requires sort of private funding. So throughout that 35 years, we've been working with uh, companies. And, you know, with the corporations, on the one hand, obviously, sort of like just on production, changing production, changing sort of supply chain sort of procedures. But on the other hand, also trying to create and incentivize sort of corporations to make that step and to invest actively in biodiversity or, or, or in sort of like, you know, climate measures. So that's what we've always been doing. So, so this sort of project and the work that we're doing with you and doing with, with Jeff is, is, is sort of an absolute sort of continuation for that. Because to be honest, when we look at the scale of the problem, we've been hearing this so many times, it is not just going to come from sort of public funding. It requires that approach with the sort of private sector. Uh, we all know that. We all know that sort of, you know, 700 billion is a lot of money. Um, and sort of like doing it together and doing it combined is important. The reality is that sort of, like, you know, public and private work on very different timescales with different criteria. And so it's being in that intersection is really the sort of strong point that CI finds itself in. Um, and that's really why we're here. Yeah. And that's and why we're sort of uh, in, in this project. Thank you so much. We're really happy also to be working with you and your colleagues as well, um, who have all this experience and are helping to guide us through this, this project. Uh, how about your reflections just on the importance of leading businesses participating in these national dialogues, would you say? So I think that, you know, the, the fact that we're sort of focusing on sort of like four countries for these dialogues first and then sort of to obviously trying to create a replicable model is really because business is actually providing a sense of continuity that sort of like governments in itself um, can't provide. So let me just give you an example. Sort of like 2017, uh, we all remember that when in the US something happened, um, which... Um, I won't make any political statements, um, 2017, but all of a sudden, actually what happened in the US is sort of businesses stood up and businesses made commitments, even though the US had pulled out of the climate agreements, business actually took over and that's really important. Now, obviously, as a smug European, it's very easy for me to talk about the US, uh, but I would always like to point, um, you know, even in beautiful Sweden, 
sector is no longer an environment ministry. It can happen everywhere. So what we really need is business to take leadership and to take a role. It's on the one hand the right thing to do, but it's also sort of a self-enlightened interest. I mean, businesses depend on biodiversity. Um, you know, in Europe, we've just seen it recently. Um, a lot of businesses in Germany depend on the Rhine for transport. Uh, we've seen the impact on that. So we are having more and more discussions with companies from different sectors, you know, whether it's banks, sort of corporations, businesses, around sort of biodiversity, and that will only continue to grow. Um, there is a leadership advantage in any sector of industry, and that includes biodiversity. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Herbert. So from both of you, we've heard we need the leadership. It provides that business continuity. We talked about transformation of the systems and changing the rules of the game, ultimately rewarding companies' performance and leadership by better management. And the way you can demonstrate that is by implementing at a national level regulation that levels the playing field and is part of that implementation. So um, also a good point on the need for private funding feeding in there too. So that was a quick intro and we will thank both Matt and Herbert with a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce my wonderful colleague, Shell Lin, who's our operations and partners manager, who's been helping with the Jeff project. Um, I don't know if my other colleague, Constanza Torres, is here as well, but there she is. Hello, Constanza, also you can give a wave, has been instrumental in this work. And what we'll do now, um, though both Matt and Herbert alluded to this, but Shell will give us a bit of an overview of what this project is about. And then we're gonna bring some companies and financial institutions on stage to understand what it means for them and then we'll wrap up. But if you have questions along, uh, we'll pause for that as well. So with that, Shell, over to you. Please come up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. And um, hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm the Partners and Operations Manager at Business for Nature. Um, and for any of you who are not familiar with us, I see a lot of familiar faces here, but um, just in case, we are a global coalition of influential organizations, and we try to unify and amplify the leading business voice to advocate for ambitious policies for nature, and especially here at COP15 uh, for an ambitious target 15 on mandatory assessment and disclosure for nature uh, by 2030 by large and multinational companies. So you've heard a lot about the make it mandatory message, and that's the momentum that we're seeing in the last few days. Um, and also, to make sure that our work is grounded in real business practice, we have uh, been very honored to have this strategic advisory group, which is composed of 21 leading businesses uh, around the globe from very diverse geographies. And they sit on this group and help us guide our strategic um, work and provide very, uh, very much the underground insights to, to guide our work. So very thankful for all these companies. And I do see you know, some our, of our sacks on the... I'm here in the audience as well. So as Siva mentioned, um, we are very pleased to share that we received the Jeff funding uh, to start a new project called Business Advocacy and Action for the Planet. And that's going to start, um, that's actually started in August, but also going to continue uh, next, in the next two years. And we have three strategic pillars. The first one is global advocacy which is what we have always been doing, which is you know, to continue to unify and amplify the leading business voice to call for ambitious policy. But then uh, we do have a new strategic pillar called national dialogues, and that's going to start uh, from the beginning of next year, because after the adoption of the global framework, we're really looking at the national level and really try to help uh, inform the national implementation of the framework um, for the development of national legislations and also other regulations uh, to guide businesses, especially on around target 15, which is the business-related target. Um, so we have chosen four priority countries, and the criteria is based on you know, many factors. For example, the biodiversity in these countries, how uh, influential politically they are in the CBD process, and also how, is, how likely is it uh, to collaborate with the government and also the businesses on the implementation. So with all this in mind, we have chosen four countries, uh, which are Colombia, Malaysia, 
South Africa and India. Um, and we do have our Malaysia partner here and you actually be able to hear from him in a few minutes. Um, so it's really exciting to start to scope this work. And I think what, what exactly we're trying to do is to uh, establish business and government dialogues in these countries to form a business kind of uh, advisory group to the government and to kind of facilitate these ongoing conversations to inform the business chapter of the NBSAPS, which is the National uh, Action Plan on Biodiversity. And in addition, we're hoping to also help with the capacity building in these countries. So for example, organizing workshops, uh, training, and also uh, help um, countries and businesses learn about the leading frameworks out there, for example, the SVTN, the TNFD, and many other kind of accounting mechanisms that are, that are out there. Um, and in addition, we might also host multilateral uh, stakeholder dialogues, events, workshops, um, and maybe even developing case studies uh, so that we can apply the lessons that we learn from these countries to other developing countries to kind of help scale up this work in general. So I'm um, very excited to share about the plan and if in the audience anybody is uh, also working in these countries and are interested in, in, in our work, we would be very happy to have a conversation because we're still in the scoping phase, so I'm always you know, happy to have collaborations together. The third strategic, uh, the third strategic strategic pillar is on business action. Um, and also, it's relevant to the implementation stage because you know, after we adopt the framework, we're gonna look more into kind of the sectoral uh, actions so in detail, what should company exactly be, do be doing in different sectors that can help them meaningfully contribute to a nature positive economy. Uh, so starting from next year, we're collaborating with many partners such as uh, WBCSD and WEF and other kind of players in the field. And we're looking to develop sectoral guidance um, to guide companies on their action for nature. Uh, this year, as you might know, at Davos, we have collaborated with many leading organizations to develop the hi high level business action for nature. And that kind of provide uh, the, the first steps, like if you're a company and you want to act, what should you be doing right now? No matter what sector you are in, no matter what stage of your journey in Nature Positive, uh, we, we have all kinds of actions that you can take. So you are more than welcome to go on the website and learn more about it. Um, but with this in mind, I will hand the floor back to Eva. And again, I would really welcome any collaborations in our strateg uh, strategic priorities. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shell. Uh, that's fantastic. So now you have the headline of our priorities, and we're going to now hear directly from some of our partners and companies. And it's my great pleasure to welcome four people to the stage. And I'm going to actually, I'll move off here so that you can come up. Um, Saeed Mazari. Where'd you go? Ah, who is... Um, the Interim Chair for the Malaysia Platform for Business and Biodiversity. Please go ahead. And uh, Mariana Samiento, the CEO of Tarasos. Where did she go? Yes. Excellent. Ben Sykes, Vice President, Head of Environment and External Affairs at Orsted. Thank you. Yes. Clap, 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 clap. And Sarah Woodfield, who's uh, the Active Ownership Manager, Biodiversity and Natural Capital at Schroders. And actually, today it's uh, Sarah's birthday. No, we're not. Woo. We're not. We're not going to sing Happy Birthday because uh, you know it's a bit too much. But I think, in, on the count of three, we should all say, "You can sing." No way! It's your birthday too. Okay, what's your name? Pasquale. It's a good name. So, uh, on the count of three, we're going to say, "Happy Birthday, Sarah and Pasquale." Okay, you ready? Anyone else's birthday? Next door. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So one, two, three. Happy birthday, Sarah and Pasquale. <laughs> okay. I can't actually sit. I can't sit. I'm sorry. The speaker doesn't work like that. So, two really quick questions for the four of you, if that's okay. I'm not going to ask you how old you are, Sarah. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, no, 21, no, no. Um, is, so first of all, what do you as companies, financial institutions, platforms need from government to increase ambitious action? And we need the ambition action to implement the global biodiversity framework. So really quickly, what do you need 
from governments. Sarah. So I'm not going to pretend that financial institutions are sitting here waiting for guidance from governments. So I think the really important thing actually is we need to collaborate. This is a systemic risk which is affecting all of the companies that we invest in. And so, and it's a risk which people are, you know, they need to think very differently and innovative, innovatively about how they tackle. So what we really need is collaboration, open dialogue, to ensure that we can develop real sector-specific pathways towards a nature-positive future. Okay, and what about government? What do you need from governments? What could governments do? So governments can provide that by facilitating that collaboration oh, okay. and conversations with, with private sector, with financial institutions, to actually look at how can we develop those transition plans. And part of that is actually getting really clear policy signaling from governments. Um, for us as investors in companies, that's one of the key mechanisms by which this is going to crystallize into a financial risk, which will challenge our ability to deliver long-term value on behalf of our clients. So we've got the physical risks, um, which, will, which will also hamper that long-term value, but actually the, the policy implementation um, is going to help that risk to crystallize. So that clear policy signaling is really important for us so that when we're engaging with our investing companies, we can better understand what is your transition plan, how you're managing that, are you going to be kind of fit for purpose in two years' time, in five years' time. So that really clear policy signaling is, is really critical for us. That's Super helpful. Thank you so much, Sarah. What about you, Ben? What do you need from business? From, from government. government. Um, so I'm going to talk about my experience in the UK um, because that's, that, that's where I'm building lots of offshore wind farms. Um, so I think Sarah's point around engagement and dialogue is a sort of overarching thing. If we don't sit down together, we're not going to achieve anything. Um, fortunately, we have already good dialogue. Um, across multiple government departments. But I think in terms of what I, if, my, if I were to send the government my Christmas shopping list, uh, it would start with dealing with the tax system to deal with harmful subsidies. Because we need, I think, to create a more, a slightly less imbalanced playing field even, uh, never mind a level one. So I think that creates the incentive. Uh, but then we talked about mandatory disclosure. I don't, don't need to go into that now. But I think I would want to work with government to talk about the kind of incentives that they need to put in place in order to inspire Orsted and its competitors to compete on the things that matter and absolutely um, stopping and, uh, and reversing biodiversity loss is one thing that does matter. So I would love to see the government wake up to the fact that it's still asking in our industry to deliver things that it no longer needs. We're already the cheapest form of power generation. Why don't you ask us instead of being a bit cheaper to be a bit better, deal with biodiversity, deal with also the just transition and, and clean solutions across the economy. There's a lot we could do with competition if the government chose the right com competition to run. Excellent. Changing the rules of the game again, a bit like what Matt was saying. How about you, Mariana? Hi, Mariana. Um, so a little bit about what Terrazos does. Um, we're a company that works with larger companies also, transmission lines, oil and gas, um, road infrastructure, to help them implement and deploy their compliance, their biodiversity compliance requirements. Um, and in that process, we also create habitat banks. So we, we create projects, conservation and restoration projects, which then become habitat banks, and we sell biodiversity compliance credits to those companies. So in our portfolio, um, our clients might be spending up to $200 million in biodiversity conservation because they have to. But the point there is, is it's because of the signal that they received and because of what policy and because there's a good mitigation hierarchy uh, application within policy. So policies can have a true impact in how much money goes on the ground, but then there is the issue of clear rules and consistent application. And I say this from, you know, coming from Colombia, where our institutions need to be strengthened in order to make sure that everybody, like, deploys this capital appropriately. Um, 
because you might, you know, agencies might be really hard on one company and then not so hard on the other company. Um, and in the end, you end up having a race to the bottom. So clear and consistent application of rules is really important so that we don't get a race to the bottom. Here we have leaders, but you know, that's not gonna be the rest of the world. Um, and then also improve capacity to be able to engage with the private sector. I, the environmental sector hasn't had the dialogue with the private sector or with financial institutions. So when you're talking about nature-based solutions businesses, it's a really difficult conversation to have because they, you know, they're not in that space. Very helpful. Thank you so much, Mariana. What about you, Said? What do you need from government? Um, um, thank you, Eva. Um, based on the work that we have done so far with businesses in Malaysia, um, we can see there is a shift where the private sector wants to be involved in shaping policy, uh, particularly biodiversity conservation. So uh, businesses want to be engaged beyond their traditional role of contributing money only for conservation activities. They want to go beyond that. So they are now willing to contribute knowledge, time, and resources for this purpose. So I can safely say that what businesses need from government when it comes to, um, I'm talking from Malaysia, would be a clear signal that on the government side, um, they are also ready for partnership. And then there should be a clear pathway where the private sector can take more ambitious um, actions on nature, where they can participate effectively in policy making. In simple terms, um, I think businesses do want their voice to be heard. And lastly, I think the most important one would be an enabling environment where there isn't any element of mistrust and skepticism on their intentions to mainstream biodiversity conservation within the operations. Yeah. That's Interesting. At the end of the day, we're all just people, aren't we? And you need to build those relationships, it's true, to create that, uh, that trust. Really helpful. Um, so we heard about the need for partnerships, the policy signaling that the governments can provide, the incentives, including tax system, you know, and the policies in place for on the ground rehabilitation. So those are already a bunch of, you know, helpful signals of what uh, business needs from government. And now if we're thinking about the importance of this national implementation, what are some of the risks of not having national business government dialogues as soon as possible to implement the global biodiversity framework. So what are the risks of not having them? And then therefore the flip side, what's the opportunity of, of setting up these national business government dialogues, would you say? And perhaps Said, we'll start with you and come back this way, if that's okay. Yep, sure. Um, I think um, we need to learn from the IG targets. Um, I personally think, this is my personal, uh, what I think, uh, one of the reasons why it failed was because um, of the lack of participation from the business sector. Because when we started to engage the businesses in Malaysia um, to introduce them to the idea of, of uh, the platform and, and policy and etc., several companies with large uh, biodiversity uh, footprints did not even know that Malaysia has a national policy on biodiversity, uh, bi biological diversity. So, and, and the main reason um, they were not aware is that their activities, although impacting biodiversity, are managed by another ministry. So, uh, and that ministry does not really focus on biodiversity conservation. So, um, and, and mind you, these business, this, this companies, um, they, were, they are large and prominent companies in the agricultural sector. I do not want to say which, you know, type of crop, but I think you know, I'm coming from Malaysia. So, um, so even on the government side, uh, we know that several uh, ministries are unaware of how businesses operate. They have issues like uh, certain co terminologies when we try to explain to them like supply chain versus um, value chain, for example. So I think um, the risk of not having a national business government dialogue is that Target 15 may not be able to be implemented at the national level. Whether you like it or not, this target needs buy-in from, from the businesses, sorry, not government, from the businesses, because they are the ones going to literally implement it. We strongly, so, so because, um, Government is just going to have the uh, environment and the, the policy, etc. But the one that is going to need to um, report and disclose are the businesses. If they're not do, if they do not understand it, then it won't happen. So yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. It has to be fit for purpose. What about you, Mariana from Colombia? What do you think some of the the risks are of not establishing these uh, national business government dialogues? 
So I would say that a lot of businesses, I mean, they haven't done biodiversity conservation, right? So it's not their core business, it's not what they do. So how are they, how are they going to start doing that? And then, and for that, you need to shape the conversation and the government needs to say, well, what's the social outcome that we want and be able to shape how businesses engage in this, you know, start putting their money in here because there's gonna be money that's gonna flow into this space and the risks are high. Um, there's a lot of speculators that could come in and if the minimal governance, um, which requires that government and business dialogue isn't set up, we can have some, you know, unintended consequences, which is not what I think those of us here want. So we need to avoid that. That's really helpful. Thank you. Good warning also that without these, it could go in lots of directions, I guess, and in an uncontrolled way. Um, what about you, Ben? So what are the risks of um, not having a good dialogue. I think in the context of the UK in particular, I think it's bad or even worse, no regulation. Um, some of you will know that the UK is not, a, the UK government currently is not a massive fan of regulation. Um, I think as businesses, we think good regulation is great. So the danger is if we don't get that dialogue going, we end up with potentially reluctant, but either way, uh, regulation that isn't going to deliver the, the required outcomes and that takes too long. So I think the, the opportunity is obviously the count, is a counterfactual that we work closely with government and we're, we're already doing this in a number of sectors so that we can align on what good looks like. Um, I think there's another thing and it's really interesting you talked about the, the issues of capacity in um, pu public sector institutions. Sadly, that is not just a challenge for you. We've been doing clean energy in the UK for, for decades and we still don't have the capacity in the institutions to enable the regulations to work well. Uh, so I think it's vital that that partnership between business and, and government is not only about the regulation, what should it be, but making sure the practical steps are taken so that it can be run efficiently. Thank you so much. Very helpful. And then last but not least, uh, Sarah. So I think one of the key risks here is actually thinking about kind of global policy fragmentation. So a lot of the companies which are going to be impacted by you know, changes in regulation actually run global supply chains. And so what we need to see is some consistency in different jurisdictions to ensure that all of that policy is kind of pushing in the same direction. Now, if you look at recent um, swathes of deforestation regulation that is kind of coming into fore in, in the US, in the EU, in the UK, and, and other major consumer markets, you're seeing a slightly fragmented response. So you've got some which are looking on at supply chain due, due diligence. You've got some looking at kind of import restrictions. Um, you've got some focused on illegal de de deforestation, not looking at that wider different um, definition of, of legal deforestation. And you've also got a mixture of commodities which have been kind of thrown into the mix. Now the reality is, is that companies with global supply chains are going to need to um, comply with all of these regulations in just different jurisdictions. And you're gonna end up with inefficiencies in the system as, as a result. So I think that global coordination is, is really critical and actually businesses with deep global supply chains can actually provide that, those insights to government as they look to implement in their own jurisdictions. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we really heard some excellent suggestions there, this last one on the need to connect and coordinate across uh, for that consistency to uh, apply, but we also heard, you know, there's a risk of no regulation or ineffective regulation. And we also heard very loudly the need for those partnerships and, and capacity building. It's both ways, actually, like the government having the capacity building and providing it, but then also from, from business. So I think we have a, a few minutes if anyone has any questions or, or reactions to what you've heard. Your experience, possibly in other countries, on what you think national Im Im implementation, Andrew, no, or anyone else, I, I'd be interested, but please feel free to share.
Andrew Peterson from the Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia. My question is, what does business, business bring to government to support and create the, um, the tools that they need to do the things that you've been saying that they need to do? Thanks so much. And if you have other questions, let me know. So what does business bring to government, would you say? Any takers on that one? I think what business needs to bring is solutions, not problems. Um, I, in, in my sadly many years of, of working with government, um, I have seen some sectors really do nothing than go to government and say, this is terrible, that is terrible. What I've seen also on the flip side is when a sector is enlightened, says, OK, let's sit down and work out solutions. Actually, governments do eventually. Sometimes it takes a while, but they will listen. They will pick up if you can explain um, and they can be convinced that you're not trying to game the regulations, but actually deliver regulations that work. So I think it is about coming with solutions rather than just saying what you've got doesn't work. Just to add to that from an investor perspective, so part of my role is engaging with the companies that Schroders invests in on biodiversity and natural capital. And part of the role that we can play is reinforcing actually to, to invest in companies in terms of the direction of travel. And so our role is as, as stewards on behalf of our clients' assets. A lot of the conversations that we're having with companies is they've made reporting. Um, based in line with TCFD, for example, and you know, a number of companies are starting to um, base their disclosures on TNFD, and we can play a scrutiny role. So we can go to those companies and ask those questions. Okay, so you've laid out some of the key risks and dependencies that you have on nature. Now we'd like to understand a little bit better how do you plan to, to manage those risks? What are your kind of short, kind of medium and long-term goals to do that? And so I think there is an important role for investment managers who are looking at this from a systemic risk perspective um, to actually reinforce some of the key um, challenges that, um, that governments are trying to implement. Thanks so much. Any of you? If not, we'll get another question here. Hi, please. Thanks. Hi, I'm David McCauley. I'm a business and finance sustainability advisor, including to GEF. Um, my question has to do with the, how do you maintain the sort of integrity of the focus on nature and biodiversity while recognizing the need for this more integrated approach on climate and also all the progress that has been made in the business community around climate? How do you build on that while still sort of trying to keep your focus? Thanks. Good question. Maybe I'll take one or two more, and then we'll hear from the panelists. Any, anyone else? No? OK. So how do we make sure we don't lose sight of biodiversity, ecosystem services, nature, and we keep that integrity in these uh, implementation phase? Mariana. So, so I think that's exactly why you, in this space, you need to have government and businesses and the conservation community, in a way, involved in the dialogue. Um, because, again, you know, it can go wrong. Like, we're setting targets in terms of 30 by 30. So, okay, so it's 30 years. We need the money to be able to get us to those goals for 30 years. And that requires making sure that whatever investment frameworks are made or reporting frameworks are made are looking at that. Companies will choose, you know, when it comes down to it, if they can choose between a product that costs $5 and one that's 20, they'll go for the $5 one, you know? So we need to make sure that those nature-based solutions that we're, we've all been talking and that now represent opportunities for business are designed to work for nature. Yes, they need to work for the financial uh, institutions so that we can get the big finance in, but we need to make sure that they work for nature and for the custodians of those territories. Otherwise, we've done nothing, you know. Thanks so much, Mariana. Anyone else want to react on that or any final reflections? Yeah. So I think there's a couple of important things that we can do to really help bring these two conversations together. I think the first is actually being quite tactical in the way that you implement legislation. So 
in the UK, for example, we already have a legislative framework for TCFD reporting by listed companies, by investment managers, and then also by asset owners, pension funds as well. Um, they've committed to endorse the ISSB standards when they come out. And so, and then we had a brilliant announcement earlier this week that the ISSB is looking very closely at TNFD. And so I think there's a, there's a tactical decision here about the vehicle that you're using to implement legislation to ensure that nature can be a very fast follower to climate legislation. So that's one thing on the government side. I think the other thing on the, on the investment side and on the company side is ensuring that we're looking at these risks as, as two sides of the same coin. So a lot of the companies that I talk to um, have done a huge amount of work to start reporting on their carbon emissions. Um, but there, a lot of them are also looking at the physical risks of climate change um, and their principal risks. Now, one of the trends I'm starting to see is that companies will kind of identify things like water scarcity as one of the key physical risks of climate change that they're facing. And yet the solutions they're talking about are all about decarbonisation, which, to be clear, is very welcome. But what I want to start to see is companies also thinking about how they're going to manage the physical risks of climate change and then to build in a conversation about managing biodiversity loss um, and ensuring that they're painting a very clear, forward-looking pathway um, to, to reversing nature loss as well. Thank you so much. Any final reflections? Go on, Saeed. I think one last one. I think, um, I, think I echo... Um, all the panelists, what they said, and, and just to add, um, the thinking has to be the same. Government and businesses have to go in, in together. We don't need, um, I think definitions are all important. Sometimes one is saying the other when, when we're talking the same thing. So I think um, in order to have that, and, and I think in, in Malaysia, I, what worries me the most is they talk too much on climate, but not on biodiversity when the biodiversity is the forgotten cousin of climate change in a way. So, yeah, we're trying to push. That's why we have the platform to say, hello, there's biodiversity. And we are one of the, um, um, I think, 17 or 20 mega diverse countries in the world. So if we don't think about biodiversity, then, yeah, so. Thanks so much. There's one more question, Antonio. Thank you, Eva, not, not making it too long. Um, when talking about the governed business uh, relationship, we are actually talking about two different markets. We are talking about the market of voters for governments and the market of uh, consumers and clients for businesses. Both intersect. Could that be a platform for engaging in the discussion? I mean, the, the actual intersection between vote, the interests of governments in voters and the interest in business is, uh, for businesses in consumers, for this notion of uh, conserving biodiversity, nature, protecting against climate, would that be a good platform for engaging? Thanks, Joe. Thanks. Any reactions? Go on, then. I'll have a go. So uh, it's a really interesting concept, and I think the idea that actually that we've got the same customers. So I think the problem we have that when it comes to climate, I think uh, those customers are waking up because they're faced prima facie with the impacts. And actually, I've been talking to a number of people, including some here. What does it take for, uh, for those customers to wake up to the biodiversity risk? So, I think it's a great idea. My problem is that I don't think the customer knows what it wants on this, uh, to use your analogy. And, and so I think this is about business and government showing, and politicians specifically showing leadership. We saw that on climate in some countries where um, particularly governments, but also businesses, were progressing ahead of where their customers were, their voters. Uh, I think we're going to have to see the same on biodiversity. Eventually, enough will go wrong in people's lives that they will say, we demand this of our government, we demand this of our business. I think it's hard to see that happening soon enough for us to avert the catastrophe that awaits if we don't act now. Thanks so much. Yeah, no, but really, really interesting way of seeing things differently. And I think I, I really welcome that. We're now going to thank our four panelists, please. And thank you so much for joining us.
Wonderful. And just to uh, conclude this session, thank you so much, Mariana. Thanks. Thanks, Saeed. Uh, I'm actually going to bring Matt and Herbert back on, please. For you've been listening to this attentively. I have a few test questions for you about <laughs> who said what. No. Uh, but maybe just to wrap up, I'd love to hear your, your reflections. So maybe, Matt, first over to you. How are you doing after this? Well, that was a... I mean, I could have listened to those marvellous speakers. Thank you so much, sharing your insights. A couple of things that, that came out of that. Um, first of all, it was around this idea that business is there in terms of uh, resource mobilisation. We hear this a lot um, during, during this COP, probably too much, really. And my sense is that we often consider business in terms of its financial capacity. But really, um, and what we heard from, from the examples from the energy sector, what we heard uh, you know, yesterday afternoon from the fashion sector uh, in, the, in the technology space, is that bring, business can bring so much more than, than simply money. It can bring markets. It, it can shift, help shift policies. It's an advisory. It's got data points that, that, that we can use. And so my sense is that we must think about business uh, much more broadly than simply resource mobilisation and really in the way that they can drive new ways of doing business and innovation to support biodiversity. The sectoral approach was one that came forward. I think if people, you know, I'm always reluctant to draw that direct parallel with some of the climate type discussions, but the IEA sectoral roadmaps were quite useful in helping align business around their Plans for, uh, plans for greenhouse gas mitigation, carbon reductions. And similarly, I think if there are sectoral guides and sectoral approaches, the Jeff is supporting TNFD. We're an anchor investor in TNFD. This is another way that sectors can road test and look at the ways that they're impacting on biodiversity, positively and negatively, and incorporate that into their planning and work towards... Um, these approaches on, on the national plans. So my sense is that business can do so much more, sectoral level approaches, and we really should be thinking about having this session again in COP16. Or COP28. Or COP, oh, fine, or COP28. Um, it might be a bit early next year. Well, let's have a look. <laughs> okay. uh, one of the COPs and, and hear about how this has been progressing. I'd like to thank all of those wonderful speakers for sharing their insights this afternoon. Amazing. Thanks so much, Matt, and that positive note. How about you, Herbert? What reflections do you go away from this session with? My first reflection is that I want to have my birthday during a COP because that's a really nice thing to have. So yeah. congratulations, both of you. Um, my second reflection is that it's sort of amazing to see that we have this panel and we actually have this kind of detail in the panel. Because sort of at, at a given point, um, it's always nice looking forward and looking at next corps. It's also quite interesting to look back a little bit and how far we've already come. So the fact that we're not talking about sort of, uh, you know, should we do this? Should this be done between governments and sort of businesses? But we were really talking about, at a given point, sort of uh, some of the interventions were really about the nitty gritty. And, and that's actually quite hopeful. So I think that that fact that there's a movement and that there's people sort of looking at solutions is great. I really like the point about replicability and making it standardized. Because to be honest, if we reflect a little bit back, that's one of the things in the carbon space that we probably, with hindsight, would have done differently. There was a lot of different models built. There wasn't a lot of replicability. There wasn't a lot of standardization. So the earlier we can do that, the better. Now that said, and all of the optimistic stuff, um, I still think that we also have to realize that biodiversity is complex. Uh, we have a tendency, both within NGOs, both within government, both within business, to try and reduce things to very simple solutions. And I think this is not that easy within biodiversity. So I just want to be cautious about that. Um, and that's also the reason why everybody needs to work together. I don't think everybody, anybody, has the complete picture. Um, nor do NGOs, nor do businesses, nor do governments. 
So those dialogues sort of really help in moving that forward and finding a replicable solution. Thanks so much, Herbert. It's true that uh, when you think about biodiversity and the complexity, actually, I think some of the solutions are pretty straightforward, but the way we measure them is quite tricky, and maybe it's the measurement piece. I often uh, reflect, if you think of um, our, our own human health, it, when you measure human health, you have many different indicators, and if you just said, oh, let's just look at one, let's just look at blood pressure, and use that as an indicator of someone's health, it's not enough, we know that. It's the same with planetary health, we have to look at a suite of indicators, but guess what? For human health, sleep always works. And for the planet's health, leaving ecosystems alone also works as well. So I'm going to just reflect two, two points coming out of this. Um, I think one that is a thread is that ultimately we need to strengthen the accountability system that we all operate in. And if you think of a business, what we're talking about here is taking what is going to be a global biodiversity framework down to the actual legal implications at a national level, making sure that that then is enforced and that companies can be rewarded or penalized if they do or don't ab ab abide by it. So that's like, that's one enforcement measure. But we also heard of the importance from investors and others of different accountability systems. We've got the legal system uh, in place as well. Um, but what is exciting is that the information is now flowing much more, there's a willingness to collaborate. And the final message is we're really delighted to be working with the Jeff, with CI, and also with all of you in the room. There's an important message here of sharing stories and, and expertise and examples of what happens in that implementation phase at a national level. So please do get in touch with Shell, who you spoke to, who spoke before, and also Constance and my team. We're happy to share knowledge, and we look forward to a really strong outcome here so that that will then lead to ultimately large-scale action around the world to halt and reverse nature loss this decade. Thank you so much, everyone.